Yo. Huh. Aubrey Edwards, Tony Shivani. We bout to party. We bout to party. Unrestricted. Got the house now. We gon' turn it up. Hey everybody, this is Aubrey and Will, Unrestricted. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Will, how are you doing? I am doing great. It's the beginning of a new week, or end of a new week, depending on when you're listening to this. But uh, I, I'm... Kayfabe, I'm brother. Oh. Kayfabe. <laughs> <laughs> no, because like, seriously, we dropped this the audio version on Thursdays, but we dropped the video on Monday. So like, really, it could be the end of your week. It could be the beginning of your week. It just depends on when this has hit you but uh, when it's when it's hitting your eyeballs when it's hitting your ears whatever orifice you prefer to consume a podcast <laughs> on exactly but otherwise i'm i'm always good i i always just try to keep myself in high spirits cuz look i'm working the dream job how could i complain speaking of working the dream job now that you've been around been around the block for a couple months now a couple months it's like 6 months 7 months how long have you been with us it's only been 4 months uh, i guess only 5 four? months but Five months by the yeah, five months, five months because it's October. It's so, yeah. like just yesterday, but also a lifetime in wrestling. Yeah, right? it's been five months because <laughs> uh, I started first week of May. I guess I was official end of April, but nobody knew that. So nobody, um, knew. nobody knew that. I my 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 all elite graphic dropped uh, at the beginning of May, May third. So there yeah, it's officially been five months. It's officially been five months. So uh, you've sort of settled into your role. What is your? I'm curious now. Uh, Cause I don't see you a lot on show day. Uh, but like, what does a normal show day look like for you? Oh, nobody sees me a lot show day. And I always think that's interesting because, uh, because the busiest time for most people on show day is like during the show. Right. Uh, I, you know, except for, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <Right? laughs> um, but like, for me, that's like actually kind of the time to rest because uh, up until that point, you know, it's the preparation of the show that is uh, everything I'm doing. So people, I, I, the thing I hear most throughout my work day is, oh, where have you been all day? Like when I show up during or, you know, I'll be in the viewing area during Dynamite or during Collision or whatever. And I'll be like, yeah, I, I've been around all day. I've been working, doing stuff. I've been in the office. Uh, and yeah, it's a really busy time because it's one of those things where I, <laughs> I'm i always busy with something AEW related, whether it's at TV or whether it's doing this podcast or whether it's uh, working from home. Um, mm -hmm. I've been pulling stats as of late. So win loss records and things like that that you're seeing on TV. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of input from me on things like that. There's been uh, times where even recently um, we had a... Uh, it was just last month we had a match between John Moxley and Action Andretti, and the graphic uh, before it went up uh, had Action Andretti's collision record, which wasn't very good. It was 0 and 1, and I was like, "Hey, this guy's got a title match. Let's fix that." And so uh, I had it changed to 7 and 7 because that hey. was what his actual singles record was. It just we needed to expand beyond collision. It's little things like that. Those are things that I'm working on throughout the show and throughout the day. And uh, of course, you know, I'm in a creative role uh, and in helping put together certain stories, things along those lines. It's 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 been a lot and it never stops. It's a seven day a week job. And even when I'm at the movies and then a text will pop up and it'll say like, hey, I need such and such. And then all of a sudden I'm doing that. So it's a never ending role. AEW is. It's a never ending role, which is why I'm very excited to uh, have our guest on today. Just kind of that like day to day, crazy, creative. Let's try and get a show on TV and hopefully see what hits. So I'm excited to talk today. Who we got? And we are joined by a man who has so much history in the business, no matter so what side of it you're on. Uh, and we were literally just talking last week about this man being one of the all time great promos. He actually has the stats to back that up. Ladies and gentlemen, it is. Jimmy Jacobs. What up, guys? I like that as soon as Will said that, Jimmy went, what? <laughs> back, back it off. I mean, that, 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 that. Look, you you do. You have the, the look, I the, even this this humble man over here wouldn't wouldn't take the credit <laughs> for it. But literally, Cage Match has one of, I think, one of his all-time great promos, ranked as one of the top, I think it's in the top 20 promos all time on Cage Match. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was a good promo. I mean, <laughs> I would have delivered it a little bit differently now, but you know, yeah, it was a very well crafted promo. Yeah, 
Either way, he's a five-time Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champion. And again, just you've worn so many hats in professional wrestling. You've been so around uh, so many different companies, and now you've arrived here in All Elite Wrestling. But this is the first time that we've really gotten to talk to you since you've been in AEW. I feel like you and I talk every week. Though. I know, right? It, this, I, I, I'm saying this as if you're not somebody that I work with on a literal, regular basis. But uh, from the perspective of people who haven't gotten to hear from you for a, a, quite a while, uh, how's it been being in AEW so far? Yeah, I mean, AEW's great. It's a madhouse. I'm, uh, you know... <laughs> It's an understatement. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I welcome the madness, though. You know, for the last, the last year... I was uh, living in rural Georgia. I bought a, you know, about seven acres out in the middle of nowhere. I was, you know, working for Impact Wrestling. Uh, but that's just a couple weekends a month, and uh, I was working on a, a farm a couple days a week. You know, I was I was living that life, and it was like, mm, this is a little too this is a little too mellow for me. I need to just like get thrown in the blender and just <laughs> whirl around in the chaos. And uh, apparently, that's where I'm best adapted for. So. AEW is my home right now. There well, yeah, th- that, that's so interesting because you mentioned yeah, working a couple weekends, you know, a month to suddenly going to literally we have our Dynamite Rampage tapings, and then you're at Collision as well. So you went from a couple weekends a month to suddenly two week or time. two two shows a week. Uh, you, you went from the the calm life to the the chaos, and uh, I guess you you basically just answered that, but. How is that transition? Do you, do you feel more acclimated to that? Yeah, it's, it, look, it's fine. It's what I've been doing like most of my life up until, you know, 2020, things slowed down. That was the first time things ever like slowed down for me in my, in my career since I was about 18. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm used to it. So I'm used to the chaos. I'm, I, I revel in the chaos. I don't know what that says about you know, <laughs> nervous systems acclimated to reality, but like that's that's where I'm at right now. I think anybody that is successful in wrestling kind of has to acclimate to the chaos. Like if you don't, you're just gonna kind of get left behind. So it's one of those. Yep, nope. You, you kind of get just used to this. Um, I think your first show with us was Washington D.C., and I remember you. I seeing you backstage, I'm like, oh yeah, this was inevitable. Like, of course Jimmy's gonna be here. <laughs> Just because you've done so much in wrestling and uh you have such a great mind for this business. Uh, what was your journey coming to AEW like? Going from farming in rural Georgia, impact occasionally every other weekend or so, to now you're on the road all the time. Yeah, look, like I said, I've this is what I've been doing my the, the majority of my my adult life. Um as for how I got here, Brian Danielson called me. He said, "Hey, we're we're starting a second show, and um, you know we need someone in the chaos." I go, well, "I'm I'm great in the chaos, man." So, uh, uh, yeah, they they needed someone that was going to be there at at all the shows, like someone who has this sort of aptitude that I have. And there's other people that have the aptitude that I have that can do sort of what I do. It's I'm not particularly special, um, but also I have no life. So it was like, hey, can you just be on the road whenever? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that says about you when someone says like, hey, you don't have any life. Can you come here and work for us? Yeah, yeah. I, I have some feelings about what it says about me. But... <laughs> it just means you're dependable. That's it. <laughs> you're over reliable. That's what they call me. That's, I, feel like I'm, I made most of my career about like not being great, not being that talented, but just like being there. That was mostly my career was like, oh, he's here. I mean, you know, you mentioned like five time Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champion. Was it three out of those five times was because there was something that, you know, someone left or someone was injured or something happened where it's like, all right, well, who who now? It's like Jimmy's here. And so that was. Yeah. You know, though, it, it was fascinating in Washington, D.C. to watch your arrival happen in real time. And a big piece of it was it, it really put into perspective for me how much you had been around, because I was watching people who had history in WWE, history in Impact, history in Ring of Honor, all come up to you in 
greet you for various different reasons because they all had very different history with you, right? It was like people who knew you from Ring of Honor knew you as as a performer, right? And then you had people who had literally just worked with you in Impact uh, who knew you in more of a creative role. And then I remember Chris Jericho was so excited to see you. Chris Jericho was like, oh my God, Jimmy Jacobs is here. And it was like, this was somebody you worked with in WWE. And so it was really cool to just watch that all happen all in a very short amount of time. It was probably like, 15 minutes, I was just watching all of these people just so excited to see Jimmy Jacobs. But I think it, it really represented, I think, how much you had been around the business at that point. What, How was that day as far as seeing all of those old faces? Yeah, look, it's always great to, to run into people that uh, you, you, you've, you've been around with. And I've, look, I've been around for, you know, 24 plus years now in various capacities. And I'm fortunate to uh, have garnered the respect of, of my peers, which is very important to me. So it's, look, it's always good to um, see these guys and then know you're going to be in the trenches with them. Because as it is, maybe in life, maybe in wrestling, I'm not sure. It's like, you have a few friends, but mostly it's people you're in the trenches with. And a bond grows when you're in the trench trenches with them. It's like, you know, me and Chris Jericho, we're not, you know, talking every every after i left wb and he left like we're not talking all the time but like now we're back in the trenches together so um your your bonds in life seem to um uh be dependent on playing the same game or or having the same goal or doing the same thing as as the people around you it's sort of that interdependence um that that leads to uh, closeness of relationships. So uh, I've been in the trenches with a lot of people over the, over the years. That's for sure. So speaking of trenches, uh, and like Will obviously knows this, but I don't. So for for like more visibility for all of our listeners, like what does a normal show day look like for you? Um. Well, I mean, the the show doesn't start with the show, right? The, the it, it's just it's it's a continue it's just a one continuous blob of everything. I mean, that's that's the insane thing about pro wrestling is that it just never stops. You know, when people want to criticize the storytelling, it's like, yeah, fair enough, uh, but it's really not possible to even have elegant storytelling because in storytelling there's a there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. With wrestling, it's just and forever it goes on. That's it. So when the story ends, it's like, great. And now the next day and now the next day and the day after that. So it's just a continuous thing. So over the week, um, you know, I've gone over what we have for the shows with, uh, with, with Tony and with whomever needs to be aware of what's going to go on. And uh, I'll, I fly with Tony Tuesday night to the to the town we're gonna be in, and we go over whatever we want to go over then, and I'll get to the arena around noon or one o'clock, and sort of cross some keys, dot some eyes based on where we're at. I'll communicate to people who need to be communicated with about things they needed to be communicated about, um, uh, with the uh, with the asterisks that nothing is nothing's written in stone yet, but this is what we're thinking and. Uh, just to get the creative minds flowing, and um, yeah, cross my teeth, dot my eyes, and wait for uh, wait for the. It's like the calm before the storm, and then the, the storm comes in at some point, uh, and the the madness ensues. You know, we, you know, the last minute. You know, there's all look the the re wrestling is fluid. It's a it's a fluid game, and it needs to be a fluid game. And you have all these. Um, different minds and different components and different things to think about and there's different changes and until it's done it's not done so once you know you have a show it's not you don't have a show until you go actually here's a better thing we can do so this thing we talked about before that's gone because this is a better idea and this is a better idea so you're constantly updated um until until it's, it's showtime so that the last you know five hours or whatever before the show are really the um that's the storm and that's that's when that's what i live for yeah you know there's a lot about the process uh i i personally wasn't aware of and it, it's it's yeah nobody is yeah 
Yeah, no, and, uh, no nobody is. But you know, I, I I love it. I think it's it's amazing. Like everything you described is pretty much accurate to a T. Um, only part I'll disagree with is that I, I have learned that until it's actually happened on screen, it's really not done. Uh, because I there have been various times where something that because you know Aubrey, we've talked about this before. How in pro wrestling, it's one of those feel it kind of things, right? Like oh, yeah. until it's actually happened, until you get in front of the crowd and realize, oh, well, maybe this will work a little bit better. And then then you go in that direction and you feel it from the crowd. And until it's happened, it hasn't happened. And that's that's truly the the beauty of the creative of professional wrestling. Yeah, there, there's actually a saying I have. It's uh, uh, it hasn't uh, it hasn't and it hasn't happened until it's happened. And even when it's happened, it hasn't really happened. Which means that, like, <laughs> yeah, is how it goes. Because even if you do something, like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter until like it's over, right? You go, all right, we're gonna do, you know, you versus Kenny Omega, and you, we're gonna set up for it tonight, and you set up for it, and the crowd doesn't care, and you go, well, we're just gonna turn away from that, <laughs> and you know, it's just not gonna. You know, or you have the match. You go, all right, Will. This is your this is your big break. It's you and Kenny Omega on on pay per view, and this is going to put you to the upper echelon. And you have the match, thinking like this is it. You have a great match, and then the next day you're not on TV. And you go, well, yep. what happened? I thought I thought this was going to be my big break. It's like, yeah, maybe or maybe not. Because even when something happens, until it until it like connects with the people, until you know you're making that money, until all of it. And, and, like it, it really hasn't happened. So all these, all these things that we think are, you know, look, I was on a show on MTV. It didn't, it didn't change my life whatsoever. It didn't, it didn't affect it at all. Like even when it happened, it was like it didn't happen. You know, all time great show though. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. In case anybody isn't aware of uh, a, a short time period, do you want to bring that up, Jimmy? Wrestling Society X. Wrestling Society yeah. X. Yeah, it was the best. Yeah, it was it was awesome. best. I, yeah. I, I, I was like all about Wrestling Society X. I was convincing people. I'm like, this is going to be the next big thing. I'm telling you, Wrestling Society X on MTV. Well, I, I'm obviously an early adopter. And uh, I was one of the people who was like, an Wrestling Society X. I, I don't think you could be a late adopter. <laughs> not in four weeks. No, I, what I mean is, like, I'm always the person who's like, something new. This is great. This is going to be awesome. And Wrestling Society X was one of those times that was... You're an early got, advocate. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really it. But honestly, I would love it if, uh, if more people knew about Wrestling Society X. More people could see what Wrestling Society X was all about. Yeah, is that available uh, anywhere? Uh, I think that, I mean, there's a DVD set somewhere. I, I'm sure you can find it online. I've got it in my, in the few DVDs I still have, you know, that's the, that's one of the ones I, I, I maintained. Yeah. I mean, look, it was awesome. You know, props to, you know, Kevin Kleinrock and Big Vision Entertainment for getting a wrestling show on, uh, on MTV. But, uh, you know, I was 22 at the time and, you know, I knew, you know, they're saying, you know, you guys are going to, you know, be, giving awards out at the VMAs and you'll be on uh, location at you know, MTV Spring Break. I'm just like, just, just none of the, you know, it's like maybe, who knows? Like, who, like nothing happens until it happens. And even when it happens, it hasn't happened yet. Like there's not, there's nothing happening until that thing is happening. It, it's, everything else is just like throwing shit against the wall and seeing what sticks and if it doesn't stick it doesn't matter if it hits the wall or not so it's like let's try just throwing shit at another wall let's try throwing yeah. it at the ceiling let's try rubbing it into the floor like wrestling is just one of those weird things where you're just well maybe maybe it'll work i don't know and then all of a sudden like prince nana is doing a dance and it's all over twitter and it's just like yep that's the thing that works who knows whatever yeah yeah and it, you know it took prince nana 20 plus years to for that to happen <laughs> right you know this is why i don't i don't worry too much about anything or anybody um in you know will has heard me say this uh i i find that there's no i i can't think of any real like injustices in wrestling like the guys that are good end up you know uh health permitting the guys that are good end up where they need to be and the guys that 
you know, are okay, end up in the okay spots and the guys that aren't very good, you can prop them up for a little bit, but eventually the bottom gives out and you can keep someone who's really good. You can try to keep them down, but eventually they become un- undeniable. So, uh, yeah, Prince not after, you know, 20 plus years, he's got to, he's got to dance and mm-hmm. people are doing it. They're great. Yep. Nothing to yes. worry about. It's awesome. I've, I've learned already so much in this first segment and there's so much more to talk about with Jimmy Jacobs coming up here on AEW Unrestricted. The fall is now upon us. And that means that from now until the end of the year, the world is going to be kicking into overdrive to feed us everything under the sun. And that also means that there's not a better time to keep an eye on those fitness goals and keep yourself on track. And that is where the FitBot app continues to lead the pack. Last year, I went on a weight loss journey with the FitBot app, losing 30 pounds. And now my fitness goals have changed. It's gone from burning fat to building muscle. And no matter what your fitness goals are, you want a program that's smart enough to change with you. If you're looking to push your limits at the gym or jumpstart your fitness routine, FitBot can help. FitBot's powerful technology understands your strength training ability, studies your past workouts, and adapts to your available gym equipment. It learns from your previous workouts and adapts as you improve. It's the perfect companion to help you crush your fitness goals this fall. Keep track of your achievements and personal bests with FitBot's progress tracking charts and learn new movements the right way with over a thousand HD demonstration videos. A full year of FitBot is less than the cost of a single session with a personal trainer. It's not too late to crush your year-end fitness goals. Try FitBot today. Get 25% off your subscription or try the app free at fitbot.me slash AEW. That's F-I-T-B-O-D dot M-E slash A-E-W. Unrestricted, Aubrey, Will, Jimmy. It's a great conversation so far, learning about more behind the scenes, how, how the day 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 to day of wrestling works and just how it's just well, we're gonna see what happens and i i really appreciate just the honesty there how it's so great and it's like yep nope we're we're just trying stuff it's awesome so everyone who's complaining on twitter about things it's like you don't even know guys you don't even know yeah <laughs> like, and i feel you know, this is something will and i have talked about just like um how nobody knows what they're talking about what they're talking about and, and and it's fine you're you're allowed to not know what you're talking about but like there's people that like you know really speak very confidently about just like they don't know and like and how, and how could you know like i didn't know like until i was in the w's writer w writers room for the time i was in like i didn't know i was in the business for 16 years at that point and i thought things were a certain way and there's even wrestlers that were in wwe that they don't they don't know what's uh, on on this side of things because they're on that side of things like so yeah people don't know what it is that we do they don't know what it is that i do like i i i sometimes i I read people say sometimes really nice things about me and i just go yeah but that's not even that's not even what i do (laughs) (laughs) like it's not true and they they think i think the biggest misconception about like the idea of like writers and, and people in creative or, or whatever is that we're, we're ultimately like shot callers. Like I have the ability to somehow like shift the show for my preferences. And when people, you know, sometimes people ask me even at, at this job to go, uh, Hey Jimmy, do you want uh, do you want this guy to have an entrance or whatever? And I just go, do you think like my, my preferences have nothing to do with what's on the show? Like, yeah. I'm as my as my friend uh, put. We're advisors to the king. That's what mm. we're, not, we're 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 not we're not the, you know leading the charge. We're just advisors to the king. Uh, I'm a resource for talent. I'm a resource for Tony. I'm not someone who's going like, all right, guys, this is what we're doing. You know, carve it in stone. Uh, so like for whatever people want to put me over for, they have to put me over like with an asterisk going, yeah, that's a collaborative process that whatever was ultimately on TV, my boss, whether that was Vince McMahon or Scott Demore or Tony Khan made the decision to put it on TV. And it was collaborated with with the talent who brought an idea I had to, to life and likely collab- collaborated with me to, to make that vision work. Uh, and so like my fingerprints are on a ton of stuff, 
but you can't give me the credit for anything. And and the same token, you can't give me the the the, the criticism to go, oh, Jimmy did this, Jimmy. No, no, no. no if, if, if my fingerprints might have been on some shit, and I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> making fifty two weeks of television a year with multiple shows per week, it's like, yeah, it's not it's not all gourmet food, man. Uh, but it's like the boss lets that up. Uh, and the talent goes, okay, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make this, I'll make this work. But ultimately, it's the boss that goes, hey, you're gonna make this work uh, most of the time. So, yeah, advisors to the king, man. I, that, I really like that analogy. <laughs> that, that's honestly the best way to look at it. I had uh, legitimately. This is the first time I've told this story publicly, but I legit had a uh, a reporter reach out to me asking about. They were like, I heard a rumor that. Uh, such and such was responsible for such and such and such responsible for blah, blah, blah. And the only response I had for that was that, guys, this is Tony Khan's show. Mm -hmm. This That is who runs the show. Uh, I don't care what you heard anywhere else. This is Tony Khan's show. And we are simply advisors to the king, as you put it. And that is that is the only way that you could ever answer that question. And... That's it. Um, I do want to ask you, though. So having been in a creative role as as long as you've been, including having created for yourself, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, what would you call the first successful storyline that yes. y- that you had your fingerprints on that you looked back and went th- that wasn't you? Uh, that wasn't about yourself, but where you got to create for someone else and you went, dang. I think I might have something with this. I mean, again, it's it's so it's so collaborative, you know. Especially, you know, the first time I, I was really doing creative for people other than me is, of course, WWE, and it's like, again, none none of it's like yours. You know, people talk about the list of Jericho because yes, that was that was my idea, and it's sort of a, a rare a rare moment that it's like, yes, I have this this one idea, and the one idea in collaboration with Chris sort of makes it onto television, and, and that and that thing becomes like an, an over an over act. But mostly, your your spitballing ideas and the creative ends up being an amalgam of what the writers are talking about and what what you know the boss wants to do combined with the way the talent puts it together. So it, it's hard to go like, yeah, that's that's me. That's my, again, th- that's my stuff. Um, there's very few things I could point to as going, this is my vision um, and all all blocks were, were, were moved out of the way and just like, I created this. I mean, I mean roughly speaking, the, 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 the list of Jericho and the stuff with him and Kevin, but again, it's, it's, it's so it's so collaborative. It, it's really, it's like unfair for me to say, oh, I, I did this. Like I, uh, I've said words, I've come up with ideas. I've, you know, but the buck doesn't stop with me on, on any level. It doesn't stop with me for as far as what is, what the boss is, says he wants, nor does it stop with me as far as like the talent goes out there and performs it and creates it. So, like, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a spoke in the wheel. I'm a cog in a machine. I'm not, like, none of it's mine. I feel like it's very much, like, you can have an idea, but until, like, someone stands in the ring and holds up a pen and then clicks it, like, okay, well, who know? like, nobody sat in a room and said, you know what, you're going to hold up the pen and you're going to stay there. And then you're going to click it after the audience kind of, like, swells asking for it. It's like, that's the kind of stuff that you feel that we had Correct. talked about before it's like you don't actually know you can kind of have this starting point but where it goes from there is that collaborative effort of everyone's trying to drive a car and they all have a steering wheel and it's like what if we go here what if we go here let's try this okay well this was on the map but let's go in this direction instead it's just sort of sort of all over the place yeah i like it and and i mean that was a big change when i know eight eight years ago or so when i started working behind the scenes was to have that feeling of going oh the buck doesn't stop with me because like yes it's like in a certain sense the buck stops with with the boss, but in a really more fundamental sense the the buck stops with the performer, right? Like that's that's who's 
that's who's bringing this alive. That's who's taking this to completion. And so um, that's who's going to make something great or not. Like you can have ideas and some ideas can be good and of themselves, but like it takes the character bringing their soul into what's given to them to make something, to make something great. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'm curious, I, like, obviously we talk about how you, you can't really put, like, it's just your fingerprints, right? But is there something that you've potentially worked on where everyone was just in it and it worked or you thought it was going to work and then it just didn't hit? I'm sure there has been, you know, again, it's like you're, you're, you're dealing with, like, there's a few things that stick out in my, in my, you know, time doing creative, but beyond that, it's just like, you're just going, you're going every single week. And this is the, uh, the thing that I didn't understand, you know, before I was on this side of things when I was just performing and going, Oh, this isn't, this isn't as good as it could be. It's like, no, no shit. (laughs) <laughs> like, not as, as it could be not not a single bit of it is because it's just like it's it's the next week and then it's the next week and then it's the next week and then it's the next week and you're 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 much more of a of a fast food you know cook than a than a gourmet chef like you just are and sometimes you make a really good burger every once in a while you make a really good burger, but like a lot of it is going, we need something for this week and it's not ideal. Uh, and maybe if we had another month to think about it, we could come up with something that's great and we could come up with all the props and the production to make this exactly right. Uh, but, um, yeah, mostly you're just, you're, mostly everything's less than ideal. And sometimes there are ideas you go, yes, I think this will hit and it doesn't. And sometimes the the ideas you think this isn't going to be very good and it's good. And then you go on to the next week. Yeah. I would say week to week television. I mean, in general, week to week television in professional wrestling, especially is unlike anything else that exists on the planet in terms of entertainment. There is no other form of, of touring entertainment that is different in every single town it hits and has to be creatively rewritten every single time it it happens and it airs you're not getting the same show you know broadway play whether it you know when it goes on tour you're getting the same exact broadway play right like all the performers know what they're going to do the next town they're in it's exactly the same um and even when it comes to to scripted television right you're dealing with uh you know months and months of uh of pre-written scripts and things that are pre-planned and whatnot but like week to week wrestling television nothing on the entire planet like it it's such its own unique thing one of the things i wanted to talk to you about though thing i've been excited to talk to you about let's get to your ring of honor career shall we yay because uh you're in ring of honor quite some time uh i believe it was a decade, right? You were with Ring of Honor 10 years. And in those 10 years, you, you were the face of a lot of different things, right? You were uh, jumping Jimmy Jacobs. You had the, uh, uh, of course, you had the the, the John Nor gimmick um, at one point. And uh, really where I'd say you, you gained the most notoriety, I, I think, from somebody who was watching at the time was was Project 161, Age of the Fall. I want to talk about that a little bit. What was, how, how did that all come about? Yeah, I mean, so that that all came out of the the stuff I was doing with Lacey, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, the Lacey stuff was the thing that t- t- turned the corner for me. Like, so I was doing the furry boots thing, jumping Jimmy Jacobs pre Ring of Honor. Oh, but, that's right, right, right. Uh, uh, I was doing the furry boots thing, Gabe, he liked me enough to keep me around. I was getting really good reactions at shows because people liked chanting "Hus Hus" with me and, and things like that. And they were like, "I'm like talented enough, but I'm not as talented as the other guys at all." And so it was the lacy thing where, like, I, I was on the cusp of um, Gabe letting me go in early 2006. I was he was kind of I had a call with him and he was pretty pretty frank with me that he just kind of didn't care about me um, and just didn't see me as a player there. And that's when I created the Ballad of Lacey and, and, um, which when he saw that, he's like, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I go, I know, like, this is what I'm, I'm, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying that I'm good. Like, I, I know I, I'm 
but like sometimes that that desperation um, breeds breeds innovation, right? Um, and so it was it was coming out of the where I'm this like love love stricken you know little boy trying to gain the the affection of of my um, of of this woman who's, who's my manager. Um, and it, the, towards the end of the story, it started to take a little bit of a, of, a, of a darker turn. And Gabe had the idea. He's like, I want you to like lead a group of like misfits, kind of like a Raven's flock type thing. And Gabe also had the idea of um, doing this, this viral marketing campaign, which Nine Inch Nails had just done something like this. So he stole it off of Nine Inch Nails and he brought it to pro wrestling. Um, and so it was, it was, it was, look, it was Gabe's and uh, it was Gabe's idea. Um, and it was his his, his inception uh, there, and we spent the summer of two thousand seven, you know, trying to come up with who who's in this group, who are the guys, um, and what's the point of this group, right? What you know, and and wrestlers don't don't get that. It's like there's, there's like there's a way that booking is done, um, and uh, there's a, there's a few things that the age of the fall was about when gabe saw tyler black now seth rollins he goes oh this guy's a star so we want to put him in something that's going to put him with people that are established and get him on the track to being a star at the same point you have the briscoes who are like the greatest the best tag team they're the tag team that was like there and ultimately like you're building people to put over your top people like that's what the job of most wrestlers are. And everybody wants these like top spots, but the top spot is like the top spot more or less. So the Briscoes are the top spot in the, in the tag team division. So you need to build tag teams for them to work with. They've worked with everybody else. And so it's like, how do we build new guys? Um, so the age of the fall was about moving me into a more main event role, creating a tag team for the Briscoes to work with and being the launching pad for hopefully Tyler Black becoming a star. That was the point of the, of the thing. And, you know, um, <laughs> kind of backtracking a little bit, talking about the ballad of Lacey and whatnot, because this is stuff I bring up to you all the time. Uh, and I finally get to do it publicly. But, like, those songs that you had done, um, you had done the ballad of Lacey, you did uh, Love's Victory and Kiss to Kill. Um those are all genuinely great songs. Like literally this man walks into the room and for whatever reason, loves victory, especially just like starts playing in my head. And I have had that song burn in my brain since 2007. Was that when that was recorded? Nice. Uh, 2006. Okay. Uh, somewhere around that point, right? Like I've had that song burned in my brain ever since I can't, see jimmy jacobs without hearing i believe like ducky said to andy like literally it it, it, it hits me every single time uh oh, they they are genuinely great songs and like i i almost want those to to exist to the wrestling world again today to know that like jimmy jacobs was at that point um, when you talk about, you know, almost having been let go in 2006 and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, making this change and figuring out, uh, you know, and, and props to, to my to my old co-host, Michael Z, for um, uh, the, the videos, by the way, on those. Oh, yeah, yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> uh, but at the time, um, it, this was really like a discovery of how much you had to offer as a character. Right. I think that that's really what independent wrestling fans got out of all of that at that point. All of a sudden we were seeing that, OK, we we knew we everybody was having fun with the um, the Hus gimmick and all of that. But but learning who you were or who you could be as a character, I think uh, that really brought a lot to independent wrestling fans at that point. Yeah, I mean, so that was the conversation I basically had with Gabe, you know, when he told me he was more or less done with me. Was me, was me calling him up and going, hey, man, I, I, I need a story. Like, I need something to sink my teeth into. Like, that's that's what I do. I remember telling him, like, I'm not a guy that can go out there and just have one great match, like, you know, Brian Danielson or, or Matt Seidel or Jack Evans, who's just going to be really impressive. I'm like, that's not, what I, that's not what I bring to the table. And he's just like, look, man, stories are nice. And gimmicks are good, but the matches sell the DVDs and you don't have those kind of matches. Like that's, mm. that was, that was his quote. Like it burned into my head, uh, this conversation. Uh, but you know, I was, I was doing that 
at, you know, at Ian Rotten's, you know, Ian, who gave me a lot of freedom to, to play. And I'm not saying I was firing on all cylinders, but like in 2001, I was, or, you know, sorry, I was 21 in 2005. Yeah. I, I was his, uh, you know, his, his world champion. And like, I, I was cutting a lot of promos and I was, I was just, I was in it. Like I was in, like, it became obvious that like, that's what I do. Starting like, like 2004 for him really it started to become obvious. Like, Oh, Jimmy's, Jimmy's like a, he, he's a story guy. He's a, he's a character guy. And yeah, he can kind of go with the other guys, but where he sticks out is that. And so, you know, the, the emo thing, which was Gabe's idea, gave me the, the, the framework in, in which to, you know, and, and it was my idea to have the love storyline with, with Lacey, but it, it gave me the framework in, in, in which, in which to do that. And um, like I said, man, like there's no injustices. Like you have, you have to be undeniable. Like you have to just like break through everything going, yeah, I know you don't see it, but here it is. Like just, it's here. Look, you know, it's like, oh, can I just dig, Gabe? Can I just do do something for you? Just we're just starting this thing with Lacey. Can I do something? I'll I'll send you something. And he goes, yeah, you can, you can, like whatever, like you know. Uh, so e- even with without the the like, oh, it's a, it's a great match. Like, no, look, this is this is what I am. Um, and yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's 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 so great to hear kind of just from the two perspectives, right? Like we've talked about you as someone who's on the creative team, but also trying to figure out how to make stories work as performers. And it's really awesome. I'm enjoying this conversation today. So thanks for being here. Coming up, we got more with Jimmy here on AEW Unrestricted. Unrestricted. We're back here on AEW Unrestricted, of course, talking with the one and only Jimmy Jacobs. Jimmy, yeah. we've talked about you as a... Uh, creative and we've talked about you as a professional wrestler in a lot of ways those two things go hand in hand um so where do you see yourself currently as a professional wrestler Ooh. yeah man i'll put on tights when people ask me to you know <laughs> uh depending on when this when this airs maybe i'll have had a match recently already you know i i, I don't i don't know uh you know like, like last that was time. why i kept that question like kind of vague by the way <laughs> Or maybe not. I don't know. Like I can't. I can't tell the future. Um, you know, the last shows I did, I did a, just did a ten day tour in Canada for my buddy Danny Duggan at the beginning of May. Uh, yeah, ten days in a row, and I'm fine. Like I'm like, look, I could be at the peak of my career if that's what I wanted. If I wanted to be like an in ring performer, I'm 39 years old. I'm I could be in the peak of my career. I just don't, I don't want to do that work. I don't want to do the work that it takes to perform at a high level. I, I just don't like, that's not what I'm interested in uh, now. So, but I'll always, I'm, I'm super busy with AEW, but if, you know, if, and when there's time, you know, in my schedule, if someone's like, Hey, Jimmy, you want to put on some tights and play? Well, of course I do. <laughs> I just like the idea of Jimmy Jacobs showing up at the uh, at the venue with all of his stuff, and then he's just got tights and boots in the bag, you know, just in case. You never know. That's just that's what you learn early on in wrestling. Is just always have your gear ready because you never actually know. You never actually know. Which speaking of which, and I, I so uh, little backstory for me. Uh, first time I interviewed Jimmy Jacobs was in two thousand and five, uh, and it was I've probably interviewed you like five or six times but uh so it's nice to be doing it on this side in 2005 i got to ask you about something uh because it was very recent um but now it's it's almost history at this point but in 2005 shortly after eddie guerrero turned heel uh you were the basically his first victim uh and that he uh actually if I remember correctly, you hold a victory there because you technically won by disqualification, but you weren't really the winner that night to anybody who was watching. But uh, Eddie Guerrero kicked the shit out of you um, and <laughs> <laughs> after his heel turn. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. One, you know, we always talk about always be ready, always have your gear. How did that come about? How were you the one selected to be 
essentially Eddie Guerrero's opponent that night. And then two, I guess, talk about sharing the ring with Eddie Guerrero. Yeah, sure. So this is 2005. I was out in the East Coast for, um, it, was, it was Manhattan Mayhem, I think. It was our first show in, in New York City for Ring of Honor. And I was staying with Chris Hero for a couple of days. He lived in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I saw that WB was going to be in Reading for, for SmackDown. And so I, I called Paul London, who's a buddy of mine. And I go, hey, we should, we should grab dinner afterwards. And he goes, well, I, I actually, I just, uh, I left a message and he calls me back. He's like, yeah, actually, I just uh, I called Tommy Dreamer. So you, you, you can come to the show and said Tommy was with um, you know, uh, he was doing office work at that point with TR. Uh, so I just went to the show and I was 21. I was just so like, oh, I don't belong here. It was so scary to me. I had been backstage like one other time with Zach Allen back in 03. But um, this is this is my first time being uh, invited by someone who didn't have heat with everyone in the locker room. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I was hanging around ringside and uh the a couple of the agents went to the couple of the guys in the ring they're going hey um any of these guys any good and uh, jimmy yang had just seen me in um in ring of honor in dayton uh against bj whitmer and uh dan moff in a tag me, me and delirious where they kind of just like beat the crap out of us and jimmy goes yeah yeah that kid right there can can sell and so they bring me over. It's like Sergeant Slaughter and Dean Malenko. And they're like, all right, take off your earrings, take off your nail polish, uh, and it'll be you and Eddie tonight. And, you know, I'm like, sure, I guess. You know, uh, again, nothing happens till it happens. I'm 21. I, I understand this. I understand that. Like, there's there's no point in getting your hopes up of going, I'm wrestling Eddie Guerrero tonight on SmackDown, which I did, but there's no point in getting your hopes up about it. So I went to the um, the makeup room to, to get my nail polish removed. And Eddie walked in, and I go, "Hey, man, I, you know, I heard we're gonna work together tonight." And Eddie goes, um, "You know, just I want, I just want to thank you so much for doing this for me, and, oh. and, and thank you um, for your professionalism. I just, I, I apologize. This match, it needs to be all me tonight. You know, it just this, this match is for me. It needs to be all me, and I, I really, uh, I really apologize, and I, and I thank you so much for your professionalism, and." Uh, you know, I saw Eddie uh, various times throughout the day. He was he was a little erratic. He was a little like, you know, he's, he's a genius. He gets to, he gets to be erratic. Um, yeah, you know, going up to me and going, oh yeah, and then uh, you know, I'll go bring me outside and you know, frog splash uh, off the top one two three, and then he goes to lead. He goes actually, uh, 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 I bring in the chair, brain buster on the chair, uh, black tiger style style, and he and he walks up. And he'll go yeah, black, black tiger style, uh, brain buster on the chair, uh, you up. And then he walks away. I'm like, me up. Uh, that's weird. And you're just sitting there like, <laughs> what? Uh, oh, did he just say that? Like, what's going on? <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, Michael Hayes was the agent for it. And, you know, he talked me over. He's like, you know, Eddie can be intense in there. So all that sort of stuff. And, you know, right before we went out, Eddie said to me, uh, you know, I just want to thank you again. And, um, you know, God willing, we'll work together again under, under better circumstances. And, you know, we went out there and, uh, you know, he didn't touch me. He was a professional. Like, it's like, that's what wrestling is. Wrestling is you make it look like it hurts and it doesn't hurt. And I had people like that, that night it was taped, you know, so that Friday night I had people like calling me and maybe text and probably calling me back in 05 um, going, oh my gosh, it looks like it killed you. Are you okay? It's like, yeah, it's, it's fine. He, he was, he was a freaking pro. And, uh, you know, I came to the back after the match and, you know, it was, felt good and then Vince got my attention he said thank you good job I'm like this is it this is oh my gosh look what's happening I'm 21 I'm thinking like the world's like happening for me uh and it was an awesome experience man I, I learned from Eddie the you know not not about just like wrestling as such although his it, I learned about how to how you treat someone you know it doesn't matter that you know, now I've been in the business longer than some of these kids have been alive. Like it, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where someone's been. Like, you don't, if Eddie could treat me like, like a human being and like an equal, if he can take care of me in the ring and not go, well, this is a piece of meat and it's my, it's my turn to get over. So, uh, let me beat the crap out of you. And that's just your job is to allow me to, to beat the crap out of you. It's like, no. It's, that's what a, that's what a professional does, and that's what a that's what a human being does. And we're all uh, fundamentally just human beings. We're all fundamentally just 
expressions of the, the, the one consciousness. We're, we're all fundamentally equal to each other. Um, and it doesn't matter what sort of title, what sort of role, what sort of character that we're playing in our day to day lives. You're, you're, you're wrestler guy. I'm writer guy. I'm veteran guy. You're, you're green kid. Like these are all, these are all just costumes we're putting on. It doesn't, it has no bearing on each human being's individual value and how we should treat them. I think that's a really good statement for those that like everyone sees as like really great guys. Like those guys that are great are not just great wrestlers, but they end up being great people as well because they're, they understand sort of the role of wrestling of everyone sort of building each other up because you have to build up those greener guys to make the veterans look good type of a thing. And I just like hearing these awesome stories. And it it is, again, it's beyond, it's beyond wrestling. It's just, it's, it's a lesson for life. It's a lesson for life that don't get, don't get caught up in the in the monopoly board and think that you're a car. It's like you're not a car. Like you're not you're not the top hat. That's not you're you're the person playing as the top hat. Like I'm not I'm I'm not the guy in creative that says you know yeah I I get to rule over you. Like I'm not the veteran that goes you know because what I say goes. Like that's not that's that's a, that's a character. That's a, that's a shell. That's a costume. That's a title that we take on. We take on titles in life, but those titles have nothing to do with what we all are fundamental. Man, Dang. that's freaking beautiful, man. <laughs> those are like... bars, man. Bars, <laughs> absolute bars here on AW Unrestricted. Do, do, do we have any other notes we need to close on? Because I feel like that's I, d- a... I don't want to really close on anything else. Like that was yeah. just like, yeah, no, that's like my motivational Monday type thing there. Like I'm going to just take that little clip play that when i'm feeling low <laughs> so thanks for that jimmy that was great yeah, yeah thank you for being here jimmy thank you for being on unrestricted i i i'm officially done pestering you about doing unrestricted going forward although we'd have to there's so much more to talk about we have to have you on again sometime oh yeah great thank you guys for having me yeah awesome thank you and of course you can listen to and follow this podcast aw unrestricted on apple podcast spotify wherever you get your podcast you can check out video episodes of this on our youtube channel at aw unrestricted hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode aew dynamite on tbs wednesdays at 8 p.m rampage is fridays at 10 p.m and collision live every saturday on tnt at 8 p.m roh streams every thursday on honor club outside of that i'm will washington I'm Aubrey Edwards. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Peace. Yeah.